to speak the truth frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. So, good morning. Good morning to everybody who is joining us, or good noon, or whatever time it is where you are. I'm Della Rucker, and I'm so delighted today as part of our Accelerate Us Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Local Economy Revolution series to share with you one of my favorite res revolutionaries, as it were. I think he'd like that terminology. Um, Nick O'Brien is someone I've had the pleasure of doing. Uh, some work with um, fairly intensively over last year. And uh, for me, the experience of working with, with Nick was not only just a wonderful energy boost, but really an eye opener into a dimension of the work that we, we all do around building community and building uh, vital, resilient um, communities where people want to be and want to be for the long term. Nick understood that and saw that and, and kind of knows how to work with that in a way that for me was hugely eye-opening. And so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the specific kind of work that uh, Nick has been doing over the last few years in Wisconsin. But the big focus for today is really gonna be on the thinking about the, what does it mean to, to create the kind of community that the Nick is talking about. So with that, uh, Nick, you are, you're, you're, you're not one who's not able to speak for himself. So uh, <laughs> why don't you introduce yourself, tell folks a little bit about your background and uh, kind of, kind of the overarching picture of what you've been working on over the last few years. Sure. Yeah. Well, first, Della, thank you so much for having me. Um, I think, you know, you have a pretty good understanding of what I nerd out about, and uh, that is certainly community uh, and connection and just originality and creativity and all of that, as we know, fuels, um, you know, action and, and acceleration and catalyzes all the great things that, that us as community and economic developers and planners, uh, we want to see as the outcomes of our work. Um, so, uh, as you had mentioned, my name is Nick O'Brien. I have been in the realm of, I should say, the intersection of community engagement and economic development for about six years now. Um, and that started, uh, little to my knowledge, when I was just a, a young boy, um, understanding. Because you're, under you're like 12, right? Right, you right. Were young, I, six I, years ago, you were like three i mean yeah. Yeah. well I, I like to kid with people that i'm i'm really just a child with like 20 <laughs> years of experience so i guess that would make me like 11 right now because i am i am 31 so if i'm a kid with 20 years of experience i'm 11 in in like real real world um so so uh yeah at, about that time i started to kind of realize why people wanted to be friends with one another and why people didn't want to be friends with one another and I don't know that I understood why that was, but I just could understand, I could see that distinction. And so even in like my elementary school days, I was the, 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 the kid that was bouncing around from this group to this group, to this group, to this group. And before long, those groups became one group. And, um, and I, looking back in hindsight now, I can clearly understand why I was able to, why that was the result of, of mm -hmm. my kind of understanding of those separate groups, but the need for them to, or the ability for them to come together. Uh, and those are some of the, the theories now that I apply to my work, you know, 20 years later. Um, it was a long road to get there. Uh, so, you know, just the arc of how I got to where I am. Uh, I decided at 12 years old that, that I was gonna work for ESPN. So at 15, I got into journalism and sports broadcasting in particular, uh, went to school for that, 
um, did a ton of you know internships and things in that realm. Had really never considered doing anything else uh, with my career. Um, and then that moved me from Illinois to Wausau, Wisconsin. And I was in Wausau for about three years. Uh, and, and, and at that, well, up into the point that I really got into this work. And at that, at that point I was moving out of a world of being the Packers, like reporter and weekend sports anchor for, for a TV station to getting scooped up by the chamber of commerce. And, um, you know, I had basically made the decision that I was going to take a year off from the television industry because it, it does work you pretty hard. Um, and in order to continue moving forward to, to accomplish that ultimate goal. Um, you got to move like every two or three years. And so it was time for me to move. But I had this experience with Wisconsin and, and Wausau specifically that uh, I just couldn't ignore. I, I felt obligated to experience some of the things that I had heard about. Um, and so the chamber scooped me up and I was then put in kind of in a managerial role of a young professionals organization that was specifically designed to attract and retain millennial talent. And over the course of the year, that group grew to about 2,700 members uh, from about 150 members. And that has and nothing- for, for frame of reference, how big is Wausau? Uh, Wausau is a, a city of about uh, 40,000 people, but yeah. Wausau is a metropolitan area of about 115,000 people. There are, there's Wausau as kind of the central kind of urban core, um, mm -hmm. but there are about eight other municipalities that are butted up right against it, that you go from yeah. one to the next without ever, ever really knowing. So if you look at Wausau right. as a metro area, which I tended to, you're really mm -hmm. looking at about 100,000 people. But still, 2,700 in that context is a ton. So go ahead. Sure, yeah, and, and, and I'll be the first to say that that had little to do with me. Um, I was thrown into an, in a, a role where I not only got to experience the things that I was seeking to experience, but I got to coordinate other people having that experience as well. And so, you know, the, however this may, may come across, like I just did things that I thought would be cool. And it turns out that other people like were interested in that stuff too, um, at least from the millennial kind of talent, you know, perspective. And so, um, after a year of about of, of about a year, a little bit more than a year of doing that, I wanted to take a step back and just reflect on why that worked, you know. And I think that's where I started to kind of uh, gain some understanding of, oh, I wasn't just like throwing stuff on a wall and seeing what stuck and seeing, you know, what people would would kind of be attracted to. There was actually kind of a theory behind this that I myself wasn't even necessarily conscious of. And so I kind of, in reflection, uh, you know, it's easier to make things and make sense of things in retrospect. Um, I was able to kind of theorize as to why these things, I thought these things happened. And then I actually put that to test by traveling the state of Wisconsin and, and, and analyzing those theories in other communities where this type of activity was happening. And it seemed to check out. Um, and so at that point, then I, I thought that it was of imperative importance to help the Economic Development Corporation in Marathon County, which is where Wausau is the seat uh, of that county, um, to develop an, a community engagement department as one of economic development's strongest tools for getting community to move forward economic development agendas, rather, it being, rather than it being this top-down kind of approach, which is typically, I think, how we, we, we tend to operate, um, you know, the planners say this is the plan and the community is like, huh? You know, like who said that, you know? So so I was able to spend about a year uh, in, a, in a grant funded role with the Economic Development Corporation in Marathon County, in which we really deployed some of these theories that got community involvement at the forefront of economic development agendas. Uh, and so from that, I got kind of really thrown into not just engaging young people, and talent as the corporate world would refer to them as, um, but also entrepreneurs and minority and women and artists. And I got really into the creative economy. Um, and so then at that point I moved, I started my own company doing this called You Are Here. Uh, it, is, it is what I call an experience and engagement design firm. So typically my, my clients, customers say, this is the result that I'm looking for. And I kind of reverse engineer uh, the process of getting to that result. Um, and, and doing that with the community at the forefront of, of that process. Uh, and so after that, I moved from Wausau to Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which is about an hour and 20 minutes 
west of uh, what's well, about equally in between Wausau and uh, Minneapolis, about an hour from the mini, uh, from the Minnesota border in western Wisconsin. And that's where I got really into the startup ecosystem type development work, um, had helped that community form its own startup Eau Claire kind of week long initiative, which was about empowering and connecting and educating entrepreneurs and, and kind of really connecting the ecosystem of assets to the goal of spurring and catalyzing entrepreneurial activity. And then from that point, um, I did create, uh, I helped a, a, a startup who had just exited create uh, kind of a co-working space, startup hub type environment um, that was really supposed to be the arena for this type of activity to happen in Eau Claire. And then I moved to Milwaukee, which is at what point I, I met I met you, Della, uh, and some of your partners. And um, and I, so I was really using Milwaukee as a source of inspiration because I'm a real small city guy. I like doing this work in cities where it's not supposed to happen, you know, um, and where you have these really creative things happening in these small, like most would say rule based communities. Uh, so I, I like to say I like to help big small cities act like big cities. And I think that the small cities actually have a stronger uh, ability to do that because there's less kind of hoops to jump through. There's less politics to play. There's just less players. And so you can make impact quicker. Um, and so, yeah, now I'm, uh, I, I still am the principal uh, uh, of my company, You Are Here, uh, but I am also the director of innovation and engagement uh, for the Sheboygan Innovation District in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, and then I'm also a co-founder of, of a new startup uh, that is called Workaround, which is basically uh, trying to mobilize the types of people who generally are drawn to a co-working space that people that don't have a remote or don't have an office, they are working remotely, like either in a solopreneurship type role, or maybe they're you know, working remote for a company, uh, you know, on the coast or something like that. Um, I, I tend to believe that the people, the reason that people are drawn to co-working spaces is not the space. It's actually the community and the energy and the stuff that you can't see. And so that that startup is essentially trying to mobilize and scale that type of uh, of, a, of an approach. I know you said keep it short, and that was the short version. <laughs> <laughs> no, believe me, I know that's the short version, and 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 uh, I think uh, you know you uh, you 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 turn down the volume on the uh, you know the energy level. Um, Start you know. A little, little, little bit more kind of low key and dignified than uh, you know <laughs> what 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 you can what you can do when unleashed. I know. Um, sure. And and the wonderful thing about your your you know just your personal capability, Nick, and you know this. I've said this to you before, is that you because of that energy, because of that enthusiasm, just because of who you are, you're you. You bring you you've got that ability to bring people on board, and so um, you know it's just it's it's always I just sit and grin while I hear you talk about these things. But you've also packaged some things up a little bit differently since the last time I talked to you. So um, let me ask you about um, a few things. Um, you said something really fascinating there about. Community engagement, that's why I was like, oh crap, where's my notebook? Where's my notebook? Um, <laughs> you said you said an amazing line about community engagement to move an economic development agenda forward. And then you very, very appropriately pointed out that whether it's planners who do public engagement, but a lot of times it's just kind of box checking, or economic developers who like would rather just not deal with those people. Um, you came at this from, from a very different angle of saying that the, the community engagement, the community being at the forefront of the economic agenda was, was, you know, the crucial piece here. So why don't you talk a little bit about what is that, what does that mean? What, what, what what is that realization about and how does that look different you started to get into that but how is that different from the way we usually do this stuff sure and you i mean you alluded to it here with with a term that i think is is growing to be you know kind of ubiquitous in um the a community's perception 
of institutionalized entities such as you know city government or just municipal government or mm -hmm. quasi-governmental entities such as economic development organizations or chambers of commerces there's the box checking phrase you know um you know those organizations have agendas to meet for their stakeholders and those agendas are chock full of projects we need to move the needle on these things and so those organizations tend to have no other choice but to move the needle on those things and unfortunately in a lot of instances those organizations feel that they're responsible for moving those needles when i feel as though those organizations are mostly just responsible for creating the environment for those things to, to occur. And so rather than coming down to the bottom, like coming from the top to the bottom with a plan, we should come down from the top to the bottom with questions and with a design process that will actually allow the community voice to be what's moving the agenda forward. Because at the core of this is, unless the community has stake in that agenda, the community is not going to identify with that agenda. And we both know that like in order to have a stake in a process, your ideas, your opinions, your considerations need to be involved. And so where I was able to kind of understand this was I tend to find my, sp my spot and I'm, I'm there. I was there in Wausau. I was there in Eau Claire. I was there. I'm there in Sheboygan is kind of the translator in a sense, the liaison, if you will between you know the 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 entities that are strapped because of these bureaucratic processes that are that are there for a reason you know checks and balances and mm -hmm. things like that and and the people in the community that really just want to do stuff you know they want to have a role in why this community is getting you know put on these top 10 lists of why you would move there and they want to have a role in why a company may move their headquarters from a big city to a small city or or the other way around. Um, and that's why I feel like it's easier to do this type of work in a small city, because you can quickly identify who those movers are. And I like to pinpoint here at this point in you know, kind of my theory is that we believe or we have made be, become made to believe that the movers and the shakers and communities are the people that are closely aligned or attached or associated with these bureaucratic entities, but that's not really how it goes. You know, we know that the good old boys club model isn't gonna work anymore. It, it just isn't. It has to be like a inclusive club that actually has the community coming forward with their ideas and those organizations saying, okay, let's help you identify the obstacles between now and the result of that idea and how can we move walls for you so that you can move this agenda forward? It's not for us to, 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 to say what needs to happen. It's for us to remove the obstructions from the people who want those things to happen. Um, and so I believe that the more that a community knows about itself and the people and the ideas and the ambitions that are within the community, the better these organizations uh, can can facilitate and and, and 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 kind of design environments where the community is leading the conversation and i empathize wholeheartedly with these organizations because again they're tasked with these agendas given down by a board or a council or a, a it's, you know team of advisors or whatever and so they feel the pressure that this needs to happen i just think we tend to approach it in in a way that is too top down when it should be more bottom up that that is okay that that nice little list of like stuff i thought that maybe we would talk about i may be throwing that the hell out the window now because okay. what you just said is fascinating and it's fascinating in part to me so i'm gonna like dig into this a little bit more here but you know, one of the things that has come out and anybody who's been, you know, sort of watching, you know, the stuff that I've been involved with might have picked up on this. But one of the things that has been um, coming forward, especially in the wake of or in the, the moment that we're in with the coronavirus pandemic is uh, and I had Anatalia Ubaldi on this 
this interview series uh, like a month ago, and who who is has done more research and more critique on what economic developers call business retention and expansion. So that's the the sort of the work within economic development that is about building the the existing economic base, if I put it that way. So building the um, the the capabilities of, of existing businesses. And um, one of the things that came has come through so clearly from an Italio's research from people like Eric Canada who have been you know looking at this is is twofold. One is that we've always said in economic development, I'm 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 you know geeking, I'm or nerding out in my own you know part of my own <laughs> universe here. Um, was that the word you used before? Like, nerding out, nerding out. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like your universe though, Della. So let's let's yeah, play. Yeah, I know. Play, so know? let's 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 because because I can't think of anybody better to play with this than you, especially after <laughs> the things you just said. So within that universe, traditional economic development thinking for a long time has kind of said one thing and done another, and what it said is that business retention and expansion is very, very important to work. And we need to do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we spend all of our time and all of our money and all of our budget on attraction, on going mm -hmm. out and trying to chase down some new thing to come to town. And there's a whole lot of sort of structural reasons why um, economic developers fall into that trap. One of the challenges though, and I've been hearing this for years because I've been kind of banging this drum for a while, um, long before you knew me. Um, but it has <laughs> to do with the fact that the economic development model is I have to do the thing for you, oh business. Mm -hmm. I have to do the analysis, I am the professional. I have to do the analysis. I have to do the data. I have to do the problem solving for you. What you describe there is a very radically different way to do that. So why don't you spin out for a minute, kind of, kind of a, 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 cons, a, a model, a, a story as it will. Sure. And as an ex-journalist, sure. you're an amazing storyteller. Um, but <laughs> but what does that process of of building the community and and what is this kind of inverted process that you've been describing? What does it look like on the ground? What does it look like while it's playing out? Sure. Well, this is the story that I tend to use uh, in explaining this because it was introduced to me and 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 I this is not an original concept it's not an original idea but I do feel like that my application of it was original um, so when I really started to understand the power of community involvement with economic development was uh, after I had launched a program in Wasa uh, called soup Wasa soup and Wasa soup was the result of uh, my learning about Detroit soup. Mm -hmm. uh, Detroit had the first soup program uh, and Amy Carhol is the founder of that program. I had the opportunity to meet her uh, in Wisconsin and we sat and talked for four hours and it clicked. I was like, this is it. So what soup started as, um, and, and I'm paraphrasing here. So if you wanna learn a, more about Detroit soup story, go to DetroitSoup.com and, and, or reach out to Amy Carhol. Um, but the way that I understand it in a stripped down version is there were was a group of friends in Detroit who was taking a look at, you know, just, they were just seeing kind of the ruins of, of, of some really hard economic times in Detroit and something needed to be done about it. Mm -hmm. And I think we tend to think about this in some grandiose vision, but little, really it's, it's incremental. It's little by little. It's this project being connected to this project, this person being connected to this person. And these things just start to turn the flywheel. It doesn't have to be pushed and start in some sort of sprint. And so how Amy and her friends approached this was, um, 
just kind of over, I think the first soup was like, it wasn't even called soup. It was just like, hey, let's get together uh, and we'll all bring different soups to try. And we'll just mm -hmm. talk about some ideas that we think may be applicable to Detroit's kind of, you know, renaissance, if you will. Yeah. And and some they, they pitched some ideas to each other. I, I think it was a group of less than 12 people. And someone said, that's a good idea. I'll, I'd throw a hundred bucks at that idea. Would, would, I, would the rest of you throw a hundred bucks? And all of a sudden mm -hmm. now, one idea you've got, you know, 15 minutes later, there's 1200 bucks for someone to start a project with. And so they scaled that and did that on a community scale. Uh, and basically what their soups would be is a low barrier to entry, super informal event on a you know, regular basis that would ask community, the community for their ideas that would help move the community forward. At, you would be invited to this event as a community member. There would be four people pitching their ideas on a stage in front of these, you know, however many people showed up to the event. At the door of the event, you were asked to donate at least $5. And for that $5, you would be handed a ballot and you would be given basically a meal ticket. You know, you, okay. there would be soup and soup is very metaphorical here. And like, you know, the stone soup type of, uh, yeah. of, of story where everybody kind of brings their own thing and it's beautiful and it's representative of, of the whole. And, and so the, the presenters, uh, I, th I think they even started with four, which is what it remains to be today, um, had four minutes to pitch their idea. They were not allowed to use any sort of PowerPoint or video mm -hmm. or visuals. We had, they had to hear from their heart how much they wanted this project to happen. Four minutes to pitch their idea. The community would have four minutes or four questions to ask like follow-up, you know, kind of questions. Mm -hmm. After all four of the presentations were given, the community would then have soup and bread and come together and be encouraged to talk with one another about which project they thought resonated the most with them and the community. And then, and then the ballot box opened and you voted for your favorite project. And it's as simple as that. You count the votes and at the end of the, of the event, the project that got the most votes would go home with all the cash that was raised mm -hmm. at the door to catalyze the project. No strings attached. Um, so I saw that concept and I was like, that is the intersection of community engagement and economic development in a programmatic model. Wow. How can I make that my own? How can I, make, not, not even my own, how can I make that Wausau's own? And so at that time I had become maybe unhealthily, is that even a word? It is now, an unhealthily <laughs> uh, 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 obsessed with vacant space, empty Ooh. buildings that were dilapidated, that were, essentially on the civic chopping block mm. like they were either going to get one last chance to be developed uh or they were going to be demoed mm. and so i i kind of felt myself be drawn to those types of buildings because they're members of this community too right and they were once very important pieces of this community um, and in Wausau, there was one building in particular that was very important to this community to that to that community and it was called the Wausau club and it was 115 years old at that time. And it was essentially the White House of the community. That is where the, that was the physical place of the good old boys club. And you oh, had wow. to, you, so it was the reason that that mentality existed in this community because you had to pay dues to be a part of it. All the development deals, all the business deals went down, you know, in that building. And so there was this, bo okay. this, this barrier to put up. And that barrier was permeating still 115 years later. Huh. And so, and that building was one of the buildings that the, the city owned, couldn't get, you know, there was some developments that started with it, but they couldn't, you know, the developers couldn't, you know, cross the finish line with the project and it just sat there. So I don't know how close it was to being demolished, but I know it was being talked about. Okay, so and wait so a we minute. held the first- so just, just to be clear. So sure. the, the good old boys club that was in, the the Wausau Club is no longer in there. Although that mentality, you know, Wausau is an old industrial town, so that um, that mentality of, you know, we've got our our ten, you know, August people who mm -hmm. will make all the decisions for us, and so be it. Um, so that mentality was still there. The building had gone vacant, and I, I'm assuming. If this is the White House of Wassa, this is not like a shed that somebody was running a bar out of. No, no. this is a decent um, size it, thing. Right, right. Honestly, let me. Uh, I'll just Google a picture of it, and you can. I will share my screen. Um, okay. 
if, if you're okay with that. Yeah, that's uh, cool. That's cool. I didn't want to uh, derail the story. I just wanted to make that sure that piece of it was clear. So while you're sure. Googling so that, I'll, I'll recap. Here, there was here, a big, oh, sorry, go ahead. Here, here it is. Whoa. Yeah, you get weird. the, you get the infinite thing. Holy so, Moses. So this is the, this is the, this is the Wassa club. Oh, and there's Wassa soup, you know, look at that down there. Um, ah. Anyway. <laughs> So this was the building and okay. I, 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 had, I had known or I had seen or heard that it was maybe gonna get torn down. And so I asked the city economic development director who we both know actually, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Schock, to give me a tour of the building. And that's when my obsession with using community engagement to fuel economic development was, it was, it was culminated. I was like, holy oh. cow, we're gonna have soup and we're gonna have it in, the, we're gonna start it in this building because this building stands for the exact opposite of what we're trying to, to the culture that we're trying to create here. Wow. And at that time, and, and to Chris's, to Chris's uh, you know, credit, uh, we didn't have, you know, a strong relationship at that point. And he saw me as like this young dude who had some ideas and just kind of had to help me hone it in a little bit. Um, but I said, Chris, we're gonna have soup. And I explained the concept, I said, we're gonna have it here. And he's like, oh yeah, in theory, in theory. So like two weeks before the event, um, I reach out to Chris and I'm like, hey, we're still you know, on board with this, right? Uh, and you know, I'll take accountability for not necessarily keeping them in the loop, but that was a little bit by design. Um, whoa, 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 you're, this is building, this isn't, isn't necessarily occupiable. Like we don't know if we can have all this, you know, ha having 200 people show up to this event. And I'm like, just trust me, Chris. I know you don't know me that well, just trust me. Um, and he did, and he did, and we did it, and, and 150, 175 people showed up to this event. Um, and, and when I realized that that environment inside of that building was the most diverse environment that, I, that not only I had ever been in in Wausau, but the one thing that most people told me after that event that, that who attended was that was the most diverse crowd of people I've ever been around in Wausau. Wow. And that, that the, 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 an example of that was I was walking through the building about halfway through the event. Um, and, and granted, this is where I kind of applied Wausau's originality to the concept. I, to, to, at that point, I know I was the only program in the country. And I think there were about 100 soup programs in the country at that time um, that, that was hosting their soup events, not in event centers or restaurants or whatever. I was fueling the energy that is developed from these soup environments, this co community collaboration, and, and aiming that at a, a building that ha doesn't have a future, and seeing if we could potentially create some creativity, some originality. People are putting themselves out there while they're on the stage, talking about their ideas, being very vulnerable. And that's permeating in the crowd of people saying, well, I've got an idea, and this place is actually inspiring that idea. And so when I realized that this was a thing was, so the oldest person uh, that, I, that I know, that I talked with at the event was like 97 years old. And she, the last time she had been in that building was her wedding day. And when I met her, it was because I heard a conversation, overheard a conversation that she was having with who I believe to be, be the youngest person at that event, which was a 12 year old boy. Oh, wow. and this 12 year old had ridden his bike, you know, next, you know, down the street by this building every day on his way to school. And just always wondered what it looked like inside. And so obviously this is not what he was picturing because as a 12 year old, you think a nice looking building on the outside also looks nice inside. Well, it did look nice inside. <laughs> um, and so she was explaining what this place used to look like. And he was just in awe. And I still, Della, have goosebumps and it almost, almost brings like tears to my eyes to, to go back to that feeling that I had. I was like, this is it. When you've got oh, a 97 year old and a 12 year old reminiscing about this building that is about to be torn down, like that was, it's just, it's just moving, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, I had heard rumblings in the community that there was an artist in the city that was interested in this building and giving this building one last chance. But I don't know that the energy behind the building was there um, until we invited the community into it. And this artist just so happened to be in the crowd. And I don't know how long after it was, 
uh, and he was not somebody pitching an idea. He was just there as a voter, you know, as a community voter. Um, and it was, it was like 60 days after that event, the city sold him that building for a dollar. That building is now the northernmost contemporary art museum in the state of Wisconsin. Oh my God. And, it, and there is art in that building from all around the world. And it is not rubble and it could be anything right now, but it's not rubble. And that's what means something to me. Um, and then well, after wow. I did that, after I did that, the city, like two weeks later, is Chris. He's like, hey, we've got this other vacant building. Do you want to do that again? And I was like, yeah. He was like, we got this other vacant building that we just acquired. You know, we it's on the riverfront. We want to develop it, but we want some energy and some creativity, like, you know, infused in it. He's like, would you be interested in doing that again? And I was like, boy, would I? So about 90 days later, we had another one. 250 people came to this one. So this is a super fun um, again. Correct. Uh, and, and, and if you're, uh, I can actually, here, I'll just, Wasa Soup 2. See, I knew I showed you the screen sharing thing for a reason. Well, this is, this is important because you have to kind of have the visual uh, to really understand like the energy that we were able to um, infuse in this building. And it wasn't about my ideas. It was about finding artists and music musicians to be the platform for the energy that existed mm -hmm. in this space. Um, and me just connecting the dots. Hey, you have this art that you want to showcase, like we can do it in this building. Um, and so let's go here and then I'll just flip through these uh, as I'm telling the story. Okay. Um, boom. Uh, I can't. I can't share anymore. That's weird. Oh wait, here. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. All right. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. So we we did a mural right here that uh -huh. said leave a note for the new owner, and we hung sharpies from the ceiling, and people just, you know, put their feelings on this wall about whoever's going to buy this building. This is the message that I want to, to send them. Uh, wow. And then Wausau is known for its umbrellas over Third Street. Well, this was in mm -hmm. February. Those umbrellas are only uh, installed in the spring and summer months. So they're just sitting in a storage unit. So we installed them in this building. And, uh, and then we had live art happening. Um, there was, uh, you know, you can see above this, it says, see the artist through their art. So she's painting Ooh. backwards. And you're able to see her creation or see her through her creation, which is kind of a little creative take. That's um, cool. But 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 anyway, um, so they we did it again, and then like 60 days later, the city came to an agreement with this with a, a food truck who was interested in opening up a brick and mortar location in this building. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, that deal did not work out, but it, it happened because that that food I heard that rumbling, and the food truck owner. Um, I found him and said, "Hey, would you be interested in would you be interested in providing the soup and the bread for the event?" And then, bef after the mayor talked at the event and before the presenters talked at the event, I invited that owner to come up to the stage. I said, "You have a captive audience here. I heard you're looking for a brick and mortar location. You just want to help. You want to put your vision out there, and maybe you got 250 brokers out here." you know, who, mm -hmm. are, who would mm -hmm. potentially help you find a space. And he pitched his vision to that space. And all of a sudden you start hearing the chatter in the audience. Holy cow, this food truck is going to be in this building. Wow. And then that's how community engagement moves these economic development agendas forward. You create the conversation at the community level, and then it pushes forward the things that the, that the entities at the top want to see happening. And so that is the, the model that I'll use for infusing the economic development process with the community development process. And it's not like anyone's project has to be a part of the economic development agenda, but at least giving them the opportunity to creatively uh, provide their perspective. And I'm, uh, town halls are great and, and you know developer forums are great and summits are awesome. But we're still kind of doing it in an institutionalized, institutionalized ways with whiteboards and, 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 and flip charts and, and all that type of stuff. People just want to play. 
You know, if you give somebody a Sharpie and say, hey, draw all over this thing that you're not normally supposed to draw all over this wall, like people, they, they like to play and it brings their, the child in them out. And that's where creativity and, and originality is rooted in. It's not yeah. rooted in being jaded because I've consistently been shot down or I, this idea hasn't worked. People just want to play. And, and playing is so much a part of the, the economic development process that isn't necessarily delivered to the community in that in that kind of package. It's so very regimented. Go yeah. ahead. What's what's the value of that play other than people feeling like happy about it and having you know great photos to show afterwards? What's what's the value of that play to making this kind of thing happen? Yeah, well, uh, it 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 loosens up uh, the grip from these organizations, it helps the organization see, well, one, you're not in this alone, and this can be fun. You're not railing against the community. You're not trying mm -hmm. to shove this vision that you have or this plan that you have down the community's throat. Like they can help you. You don't have to be responsible for finding this information or these people. You just have to open the door and let them come. And people aren't gonna come to a city council meeting unless they've been there before and have understood that it's not really the, you know, the curmudgeon, it doesn't have to be the curmudgeon -y old type of environment that you think it may be. So really like it's these environments, vacant buildings, N nobody's, nobody, it's a neutral space. Nobody's better than anyone else when you invite them into a vacant building. And I did not allow, like I did not allow the people from city council or even the mayor. Uh, I told the mayor the first time that we did this, you cannot come in a suit. You have to come as you, as a person. And he came in a drink Wisconsin to bleed sweatshirt and I loved it. <laughs> and the, and the, second, the second event, he was coming from a city council meeting and he walked up to the stage to give his address, you know, just kind of in support of this activity. And he had his tie on. And I said, Mr. Mayor, if you don't take that tie off, I'm gonna come at it with a pair of scissors. And he ripped the tie off on stage and threw it into the audience. <laughs> And so it just, it just, it just brought him down to a level yeah. that was humanized. It wasn't like, I'm going to hate the mayor because I pay taxes and I don't have a say in what that, what the city does with that money. It humanized him. Everybody needs to be on a level playing ground. And then that's where the pressure is relieved from the top to feel like they have to be the ones with the answer. And the jadedness from the bottom is relieved of, they don't understand me. They're not listening to me. So it's really that, and this event served as I, like to say, like, but what I, these programs, these initiatives, these campaigns, these events that I create is really just an embodiment of me as a person and being that liaison, that translator, that thing that can go to these different groups as an 11 year old and say, hey, look, you guys are all interested in the same things. You're just saying it different ways and you're not understanding what in the language is that they're saying it. In. And you just have to humanize it. We're humans. First and foremost, we are humans before your economic development professionals. We are humans before your taxpayers. We are humans and humans make cool things happen. And that's, that's, that's the power of community engagement with economic development as, as kind of the goal. Damn, I can't write fast enough. Humans make cool things happen. That's awesome. And this is what my note page looks like right now. You can't hardly see it, but it's like, see all the, see all the big print and the scribbling and whatever. That's, um, no, that's, that's, that's awesome. I love so how I've applied, you, I've sorry, go ahead. I've applied that, I've applied that strategy to a number of other like kind of targets, you know? So mm -hmm. that was just, that was kind of a validation of the theory that I had mm -hmm. and it, and it, it just, I don't know. I'm sad that, that that program doesn't exist in Wassa anymore. And, and um, that, that kind of gets at me every single day because that, to me, that means that I didn't do a good enough job of giving the community ownership of that program. Um, but we did do it three day, or three times in, in, uh, in a year, in, in nine months, actually. We did it once a quarter for, for nine months. And um, we raised over $4,000 for three separate projects, uh, one of which is now like the city has a committee committed to it, um, you know? So it's just, 
uh, it was a, it was a cool experience and one that showed me the power of community engagement. So that was a long That's story, it. but you asked. No, it, so. yeah, I, I did. I did. These things happen. Um, I really love the the humanity of it, and and the fact that you saw and I and and I you know yeah you've been in that translator position and you completely are the kid who goes from one circle of friends to the other circle of friends and you know and and and, and gets them to all understand each other um but what i love about this is that very often and i you know have a long history with um commu with with the public engagement side of the work to the point where i won't do it anymore um in a in a conventional fashion i i turn down those jobs because i don't want to be part of that box checking process but what you did there is not only give power to the community members which a lot of people will talk about you know uh, you know on more of a uh, a particular end of the spectrum you know the people need to be making the decisions and the people need to you know and that's very legitimate, but you also found the benefit for the elected officials, the appointed mm -hmm. officials, the, 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 the people who are supposed to be the experts and who in a world that is changing in flux. Um, you know, I, I started by talking about conventional theory of business development, business retention and attraction. I always say it wrong is you know, built on a very particular model of what a professional is supposed to look like. And fundamentally, that model doesn't work anymore. Certainly right. Certainly not in this context. And, and you, you humanize it. You made it accessible. Right. And at the core of attraction is creation. You know, I like to look at instead of attraction and retention, it's creation and involvement. Like that's what, that's the model in, in, in any number of words like or any choice of words attraction and retention is so ubiquitous that the community has gotten to a point now where we just roll our eyes when we see that you know or we hear that but creation i, I like to look at the economic gardening approach versus the economic development approach you know the mm -hmm. the, the strategy for as long as i've known it which isn't that long but you can attest to this um is okay let's take a look at what our community has and see what it doesn't have. And then let's spend all of our time going and hunting down the things that we don't have from other communities to try to get them to come here. Well, mm -hmm. it, my process starts the same way. Let's take a look at the community, what it has, but let's use what it does have to create what it doesn't have versus try to find that elsewhere. And when you put what, you, your, what your community has and what it doesn't have, through a bullhorn to the rest of the world, guess what? Those people that have what you don't have come on their own because they see an opportunity to fill a void that's not being pitched to them as like, you know, you're gonna wanna do this here. People want to do things on their own accord because they've been led there, not been told to do it, or they've been shown that this is an opportunity for them to contribute or to make impact. People just, even as a kid, you know, what, you know, I can say this, my mom and dad told me to do something. Guess what I did? Not that, you know, it's the same <laughs> thing, right? So like, we're no Why different. Why did I think that? The, right. And, and, and we're no different in the community and economic development sphere. If this, if this message is this vision comes down from the city, we're programmed as humans to say, no, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to do our own thing. You know, we're no different. We're all just kids with, you know, some years of experience. Um, so, so when, so when you're able to say, Hey, look, this is what we don't have. And with all pride removed, this is what we need. Who out there has what we need. And you're going to get people in the community stepping up to have at least ideas to fill that void, or you're going to get people coming to you from other communities saying, look, look what I've done in this other community. Uh, I, I think there's a, a potential value for that being here. If, if for only that you've identified that it doesn't exist here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, uh, that's fabulous. I, 
Della, you know, I could talk about this for hours and I, and I do every day. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine you getting, uh, getting tired of talking about it. Um, and, and the, the amount of kind of work that you've been putting into this really shows, especially to me and how you've really crystallized some things that, you know, I, I've, I've said for years that one of the, one of the huge challenges for me personally has always been that I started within these professions. I started in planning. I started in economic development. I learned the way you're supposed to do it. And sometimes when you've learned the way you're supposed to do it, if you're in a very predictable environment, that's a benefit because it's like, okay, I have the roadmap and I walk down the roadmap. But in a world where, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily fit anymore, finding those new approaches and those new models, 98% of, of not anything that I've ever been able to come across that was um, groundbreaking or advancing or changing the paradigm or whatever. It wasn't me. It's just, it, it's folks like you who, who, who bring a different perspective in and are able to integrate that and create something new and beautiful out of it. So it's, it's, it's fabulous. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate and I'm also very grateful that I haven't been academically trained in this. But I've been trained, I've been trained through the human experience. And I know that I have ideas, I have ambitions to make impact. And I'm no different than anybody else in the community. And what I've been able to do is make that accessible to other people just like me. I got, I got lucky and handed a position through the Chamber of Commerce after getting out of, you know, the television industry that got me a seat at the table. And I realized, holy cow this is where stuff happens. Like, this is where stuff gets done. If you ever wondered, like, how does it, like, how did this come to be? Like, God, we have this problem that's 50 years old. How did this even start? Well, it was at the table and it was, ba it was a decision made by people sitting around the table. And very rarely are we inviting the people that are just so incredibly passionate and almost to like the point of like anger for their ideas and their ambitions. They're not around the table. So you, I felt the obligation to be the conduit of that voice. And I was given the opportunity to do that for myself because I got to see at the table. Now my approach is not about moving my things, my ideas forward. It's how can I duplicate the process that was handed to me, that I was privileged and, and, and fortunate to be handed. Um, and, and that's kind of just the crux of, of my work. Like I have the platform. I want to share the platform. It's not my platform. It's your platform. You're paying taxes. You're the ones that are, you know, you know, make working all the service jobs, which is why the, the business people come here to eat at the restaurants and, you know, work, drink at the breweries and all of that. Like, those are the people who are fueling a community. It is the economic development and community development sectors responsibility to guide and remove obstacles not to plan necessarily. I mean, there's a planning component to it, but it's to ask questions and to remove obstacles, you know, not to set the vision. And, and, yeah, and I, I enjoy our conversation so much, Della, because I mean, I, I, don't, I don't mean this the wrong way, but like you do have the academic training. You do have the fancy letters behind your name. And so we can come at this from both sides and that's how it needs to be done every time. You know, the, the academics and the intellectuals really just collaborating with the creatives and the, and the people with ambition. Um, and that makes this beautiful harmony that we see in places like, you know, I, I could name any list, you know, a, a list of cities that we know this is all happening, in, you know? Uh, and I like to believe that it can happen more in smaller cities and quicker in smaller cities than it does in bigger cities. That's my personal opinion though. And I would love to have that conversation one day. Maybe that's a, a, an opportunity to come back together and kind of do a part two on this. Um, before yes, we, please. Yeah. Well, I got some other things to talk to you about, too, coming out of this. I got mm, thinking going on here. Okay. Um, <laughs> but the other, the other thing 
so, so the one thing I want to wrap up with here was as we started, we talked a little bit about, you know, some of the things that you're working on um, with regard to, um, you know, work around your, your role now with the, in Sheboygan County, um, et cetera. Give me, give, give, give the folks who are listening and watching um, a little bit of picture of kind of what you think is the next frontier. Where are you going? Whether it's with Workaround, it's with Sheboygan County, or, or um, kind, kind of where do you think this, this thought process, this, this, uh, this, 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 this whole system development, where do you think it's going next, at least in your world? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, it's going somewhere. We we don't have much of a choice. Like we're not going we're not going back to the normal. Like normal is what got us here, you know. Uh, <laughs> so and and I like to think of the environment that we're experiencing right now as the biggest slap in the face of like, hey, <laughs> like maybe maybe it's not working that way anymore, you know. And and however you want to uh, apply what I just said, it's probably uh, accurate in any sector in any you know application of it. So. You know, and, and using kind of COVID as the as the black, the backdrop here, um, what we've been gifted with as a society, as a, as a, as, as communities, mm -hmm. is a heap and pile of new problems to solve. And right next to that pile is another pile of problems that we thought we had solved, but those solutions are no longer applicable. And problems are not just uh and let me frame these up maybe a different way N rather than being problems they're challenges and then mm -hmm. if if you're of my uh you know thought process challenges are opportunities right so we have these heaping piles of opportunities and and what the most creative and ambitious people have that is baked into their being is wanting to solve problems and so we have been gifted with an incredible opportunity to allow that to happen. And it's not our responsibility as economic and community development professionals to solve those problems. It's to frame them up in a way that the community can apply their solutions to. And so what that's going to do is revolutionize the way that we go about doing things because results create revolution and, and results right now, as we can see in a lot of sectors, are not coming from the top. We're seeing a lot of the problems being framed up by the way that they've been approached by the top all these years. And so I actually think, and you know, I don't, I'm not trying to like say anything controversial, but I think it's safe to say that maybe there's been some poor leadership in this, in, in this uh, time that we're experiencing like maybe a lack of communication, maybe misinformation, maybe mixed messaging. And, and, and it's not just the top that's responsible for that. Social media has given now everybody a platform to mm -hmm. validate their ideas and their opinions. And if it's if it's your opinion, you can probably find it to be factual on the Internet. So so um, the, the, the goal here, and this is where I think it, it has the potential to go, is to revolutionize the process about how we solve problems. Um, and however that looks, uh, it, it's already starting to happen, you know, uh, because of some, you know, maybe lack of communication or, un or uncertainty maybe is the crux here. When people are uncertain about the, the future, the people who thrive in uncertainty come to the top. That's where the visionaries come to the top and say, hey, you know, this vision that I've had for the last, you know, however many years, it was just so crazy at that time that like it didn't jive with what we knew to be the truth or what we knew to be certain mm -hmm. that now because uncertainty is a kind of thrown out our certainty is kind of thrown out the window that idea is just so crazy that it might work because at <laughs> least it's something that we can look at and say hey yeah that's a future that i want to be a part of and that's a process that i think will get us there beautiful so we've been gifted with an opportunity. It's how we use it right now. And the communities that lean into that opportunity and the uncomfortability of uncertainty are gonna be the communities that bounce back the quickest. 
Awesome. Awesome. That is, that's spectacular. Um, just, just for, for one last bit. So, so your website and, and this will be posted with the blog posts and with the audio and the video, um, the website for your experience design studio. Did I get that right? Is that the phrase you're using? experience and engagement design firm there we go there I we go I don't, I don't like titles and terms or they don't mean anything to me so you call whatever you want your eggplant is called <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> so, um so you are here if folks want to learn more about your work um it's you are here dot community so after the dot instead of com it's community sorry Right. Well, and there's there's actually not a website out there because this so this work is so hard to explain in a universal application. If you'd like to to uh, I guess my recommendation is if you'd like to hear to talk with me more to learn more about what I'm working with. My website is let's sit down and have a cup of coffee or a beer or a Capri Sun or a juice box or whatever you want to have. Like, let's have a conversation. I don't think people's understandings of 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 your work happens in this is my opinion it doesn't happen in this yeah. conventional way of i'm going to read your profile and then i'll have an understanding of, of, of what you do okay because uh, what i do what i do is going to it's it's it is it is universally applicable but it's not universally explainable if that makes any sense okay so give your email then sure so it's just n-i-c-k my my first name nick at you are here dot community um, and, uh, and then you can find me on LinkedIn, you know, or, or I don't, I'm not very active on Twitter, but maybe you can help me be more active on Twitter. Uh, kind of my, my social media handle is Wisco Nico. Um, so at Wisco Nico will get you my Instagram, my Twitter. Uh, I don't, I'm not really active on social media. So just send me an email or, or reach out on LinkedIn and we'll set up a time to chat. Uh, awesome. I, I certainly, if you're, if you're tuning into this, I definitely want to chat with you. Because my guess is we can have as fiery a conversation together as Della and I have had. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And workaround is that? Um, does that have a site Work yet? Around, workaround is still in its uh, kind of early stage development, where we are beta or in a beta phase with a very small number of people. Uh, so we don't we we have a website, but it's not ready to be viewed. Um, because it's still it's a, very wire wireframe. Okay. Um, yeah. So so we will uh, be reconnecting on sure. uh, workaround and uh, you know, some of these other good things in the near sure. future. And I'd, and I'd love an opportunity to share what we're working on um, in Sheboygan because what this community is efforting is unprecedented for a community of its size. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's really quite bold. And that's typically the type of work that I run to is when people say that can't be done, you know, I'm like, well, let's try, you know, let's, <laughs> let's play. Let, let's, let's, let's play. Let's play. It's fascinating that, that the most recent interview or the most recent conversation that I did on this platform was with a gentleman named Jaime Izrieta, who um, developed a strategy for helping businesses that are kind of like, oh my God, how do I make it now to, to reconnect with their passion and pivot on the basis of that. Um, and his terminology again is play, even to the point where that company that is named after the game of hopscotch or that, that model is named oh. after the game of hopscotch. It's, it's, I love that. Yeah. I, I think the whole idea of treating um, some of this work as as play and what that really means that might be another one for for the future too so yeah yeah this this we could what's what's the line from Casablanca Charlie or what I believe this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship except uh, you know it's not line. the beginning so sure, so sure okay I gotta remember not to try to do impersonations on these things anymore now no, I love it you're no, no you're stop. playing it's, it's, it's <laughs> abs I support it and I'm gonna encourage it so all righty all righty cool next time I have to know what the character's name is before we you know go there but you know so be it sure all right Nick 
thanks a ton. It's it's I'm always so happy to get a chance to talk to you. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm dying to see what you've got cooking in Sheboygan with workaround and with everything else. And we got to talk about some other things too. All righty. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you, Della, not only for this conversation, but for everything that you've done for me. I've enjoyed Im immensely our relationship. And I think we've only known each other for like a year and a half, but boy, I feel like I've known uh -huh. you my entire life. So yeah. cool. um, this woman is amazing. If you didn't know that already, if you're tuning in, you probably already know that. Uh, but if you're here, like, because you're in my network, reach out to Della because she is amazing. Um, and she, she does bring this, this very like curious mindset to something, to a, a space that is typically very, uh, like siloed and, 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 and almost like parochial. So, so, um, yeah, yeah. continue doing you Della. I love All it. Right. I love seeing it. Cool. All righty. I will, I will catch up with you later. Thank you again, Nick. And thank you for everyone yeah. for, for listening and watching. All righty. Awesome. Later, Cheers, Gator. Bella. Au revoir. To speak the truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert...